Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Queen's Free Speaking of Health Lecture Series. Shall we talk about the elephant in the room? Yes, I got a haircut. Lovely, isn't it? No, I am uh, recovering from a cold, so in the interest of protecting you and protecting myself, I'm wearing this lovely mask that I saw coming off the uh, runways of Milan, so I thought it was trendy. I think Kendall Jenner was wearing one, so. Uh, tonight's lecture is called Preventing Colon Cancer. Don't wait until it's too late. You may not know, but March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, and so that's what we're going to be talking about. My name is, since I'm wearing the mask, I can say I'm Angelina Jolie Tanaka. Uh, but no, my name is Lisa Sakia. I'm with Corporate Communications here at the Queen's Health Systems. And on behalf of Queen's, I welcome you all this evening. At this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Christy Lopez, board certified gastroenterologist, to ever stand. Thank you. She graduated from the University of Hawaii John A. Burns School of Medicine in 2008. She did her residency training at the UH Internal Medicine Residency Program and was the chief medical resident at Kuakini Medical Center. She then went to the University of Missouri, Columbia, for her fellowship in gastroenterology. Dr. Lopez is a general gastroenterologist who performs colonoscopies and I, I believe this is 28 letters, esophagogastroduodenoscopies, or EGD. In addition, she has training in capsule endoscopy, or PILCAM, esophageal manometry, esophageal pH studies, and radiofrequency ablation for Barrett's esophagus. She has certifications in both internal medicine and gastroenterology, and she joined our Queen's Ohana in 2015. Please give a warm welcome for Dr. Christy Lopez. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to listen about colon cancer prevention. So, well, we kind of already went over this, but I thought I would say I was born here at the Queens Medical Center, and everybody doesn't really care about the stuff below. They actually just care about where I went to high school. So I went to Pearl City High School and graduated from there. Um, and we kind of went over this. But as you can see, it took quite a while to get to where I am today. Um, Today, I do uh, work at the Queen's Colon Screening Program. That's part of uh, where we do a lot of the colonoscopies. And this is uh, my, my GI Ohana here. We're actually out at the farmer's market preventing, um, trying to prevent colon cancer by encouraging people to get their screening. And as you know, March is uh, Colon Cancer Awareness Month, and we were there uh, promoting that. So everybody's probably wondering, why would you do colonoscopies, right, for a living? Well, uh, this speaks very uh, near and dear to my heart. My um, uncle was actually diagnosed with colon cancer quite early. Uh, fortunately, he was diagnosed early and was treated early. So he is alive and well today. Uh, that encouraged my mother and my other uncle to get their colonoscopies, and luckily they... Um, they had polyps, and luckily they got removed. So uh, they, are, uh, they were prevented from getting colon cancer by having the polyps removed. Let's start by the ba with the basics. So this is the digestive tract, and all gastroenterologists study the digestive tract. So it's a group of uh, organs focused on digesting uh, the food that we eat. Uh, through the different organs, uh, it helps to provide fuel for our bodies. It starts at the mouth and goes all the way to the rectum. So here you can see that this is the esophagus or the food pipe that connects the mouth to the stomach. In the stomach, uh, the food particles accumulate and actually uh, get the muscles of the stomach compact the food to very small size. Then it goes into the small intestine and it goes through these many feet of small intestine until it hits the colon. The colon is about four to six feet long. 
the main job of the colon is to reabsorb water and get rid of the waste. The way that the colon gets rid of waste is through a bunch of muscle contractions called peristalsis. So initially, fluid from the small intestine comes here in the right side of the colon, although this is the left side of the picture, this is the right side of your colon. And it starts off as liquid. And as the colon absorbs the water and the stool gets pushed through the segments of the colon, it then gets stored here um, as feces and gets eliminated. The colon has different parts. Uh, you can see here, this is the appendix. This is the connection to the small intestine. This here is called the cecum. This is one of the areas that we uh, take a photo of when we do the colonoscopy to let you know we got all the way to the right side. The ascending colon goes up. This is actually where your liver sits and it's called the hepatic flexure. Then the transverse colon, which goes across the middle of your uh, stomach area. The splenic flexure is actually where the spleen uh, sits as well. Going down to the descending colon, this S shape here is called the sigmoid colon, and then down to the rectum. If you take a closer look at, this is a cross section of the colon, you can see that there are different layers of the colon. The top layer is called the mucosal layer. And this is uh, the one that's closest to the inside or the lumen that we see here. The next layer down is called the submucosa. And further down, you have mus muscle layers called the muscularis layer and then the serosal layer. So these layers go from the inside of the colon, you can see here, all the way down. Sometimes you can find abnormalities in the colon, and one of the things that we do when we are doing colon cancer screening is looking for polyps. And these are polyps. A lot of patients ask, what are polyps? It's actually a non-cancerous growth found in the lining of the colon. Some can look like small bumps, and they're found in all of those sections that uh, I reviewed earlier. And they're in various shapes. They can be, be flat and very difficult to see. They could have a little hump, which is called sessile. Or they can have a stalk and look kind of like a mushroom, and that's called pedunculated. So the progression of a polyp from normal to cancer kind of takes this pathway. So first you can have normal bumps, which we call hyperproliferation, or there's a lot of cells that are turning over, turning over, and then it looks like a bump. Sometimes we would take out these polyps in the colon and they would come back as benign. And maybe your doctor has told you the polyps were normal or the polyps were benign. Um, and this is the first kind of stage of the progression. The type of polyps that we're actually looking for and the purpose to remove are called adenomatous polyps. They can be in various sizes. A smaller one, which on some of the colonoscopy reports is described as diminutive, or little larger ones that take a little bit more effort to take out. As we continue the progression, uh, the next one is called dysplasia. So as the polyp grows larger and larger, there are more changes that are found in the middle of the polyp or in any actual section of the polyp. And this is one that we need to keep a close eye on um, because it can progress to what is adenocarcinoma, which is colon cancer, and invasive cancer, which is known as metastatic cancer. So the whole point of screening is to get the polyps at this stage here so we can remove them and prevent it from getting to this stage here on the right. 
Sometimes polyps can be very difficult to detect. Let's take a look here. Can you see the polyp? So in actuality, this is called a sessile polyp, or a, uh, this is actually a sessile serrated adenoma, which is a very flat polyp, um, and it's outlined here. This one might be a little bit easier to see, but still very faint. So this polyp is there on the left-hand side of your screen. So as you can see, it's probably very important to get the colon cleaned out very well, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Doc, how can I reduce my risk of colon cancer? Well, eat less, exercise more, and invent a time machine, and go back and choose parents with better genetics. <laughs> so unfortunately, there are some risk factors that you cannot change. As I mentioned earlier, a family member with colon or rectal cancer is, a, is the biggest risk factor. And a personal history of colon polyps yourself is also a risk factor. I want to mention that normal colon cancer screening starts at the age of 50 if you do not have a family member with colon or rectal cancer. If you do have a family member with colon or rectal cancer, you should start at age 40 or 10 years before the age of diagnosis, whichever comes earlier. So if you have a family member who was diagnosed with colon cancer at the age of 45, and that's a first degree family member, meaning that you have a sibling or a parent, if they were diagnosed at the age of 45, you would come in for your colon, colon cancer screening at the age of 35. If they were diagnosed at the age of 57, you would come in at the age of 40. And that not only applies to colon cancer, but it also applies to these adenomatous polyps that I had talked about. So the precancerous type of polyps, you should also come in earlier at the age of 40. If you have a personal history of inflammatory bowel disease, what these diseases are, um, they're called ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. And um, those are diagnosed based on colonoscopies. Smoking cigarettes is a modifiable risk factor, one that you can actually stop from doing. But cigarette smoking puts you at risk for many cancers, colon cancer being one of them. In addition, drinking three or more alcoholic drinks per day is another risk factor. Being obese, so that's a BMI of 30 and greater. Having an African American background so African Americans are actually recommended to have their colon cancer screening starting earlier at the age of 45. Having older age, so if you're 60, 70, 80, just puts you at higher risk of having polyps or having cancer as well. Some of the symptoms that you should be watching out for, uh, blood in the stool. So blood in the stool can look like black it can be red, it can be maroon, or it can be invisible. And we'll talk about some of the testing that you can do to your stool to detect blood in the stool. If you're noticing narrower stools, so when we learn in medical school about what narrower stools are, we call them pencil thin. So if your bowel movements are going from nice log-shaped bowel movements to very thin, bowel movements, that might be a symptom of colon cancer. Changes in the frequency of your stool. If you're having more frequent bowel movements or if you're feeling like your bowel uh, is not completely empty, it was what we call incomplete evacuation. If you're having significant weight loss, which is unintentional, if you're feeling some abdominal pain or if you're lethargic or feeling very tired. These are symptoms that you would want to bring up to your primary care physician um, so you could possibly discuss further testing. Some interesting facts about colon cancer. Colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer in the United States, and it's overall the second leading cause of cancer death. So if you look down here, 
uh, colon and rectal cancer for males. It accounts for about 9% of all the cancer death, lung cancer being um, one that's greater. For women, there's lung, breast, and then colon. And uh, this data comes from, I think, 2017, where it accounts for about 8% of cancer death. The good thing about colon cancer is it actually has a screening tool that is recommended for the general population. For lung cancer, uh, there is no general screening tool for the population. For females, there is the mammogram. You get your, uh, for breast cancer, you get your mammograms. But it is very important to get these screening tests done to prevent cancer death. What are some methods of colon cancer screening? Well, we have the fecal test. That's not quite the stool sample we had in mind. So these are the stool samples we have in mind. Basically, the first test is called an fecal occult blood test. So this is looking at microscopic uh, blood in the stool. You might not be seeing any blood in the stool. You might not seeing, be seeing the black or the red, the maroon. Um, but this test, by taking the... Um, the little uh, wooden spoon thing, and taking some of your stool and wiping it on your card, on the card, there's actually a chemical reaction done by um, a fluid that you put on, and it's, it can tell if you have blood in the stool. One of the things is that it can't tell the blood apart from any other part of the GI tract. So if you're bleeding from an ulcer in your stomach or you have reflux and you have inflammation in your food pipe, uh, this test could be positive as well. If the test is positive, a colonoscopy is needed. If you elect to do this method of colon cancer screening, it is required to be done yearly. This is a different type of stool test, and it use, uses a different type of chemical reaction. But the difference between the first test and this test, you do three stool cards for the first and three stool cards for this, but it actually can tell the difference between the top and the bottom. So if this is positive, a colonoscopy is indicated, and this is also done yearly. You may have seen the commercials on TV for Cologuard. It has a little uh, cartoon guy that's in a box and telling you to mail in your samples to uh, Cologuard. This actually detects abnormal DNA in the stool, and it also detects uh, blood in the stool as well. If it is positive, a colonoscopy is also indicated or needed. And this test, unlike the other stool tests, can be done every three years. Barium enemas aren't done as frequently anymore, probably because I've heard from patients that it's quite uncomfortable. Uh, the liquid containing the barium is actually put into the rectum, and it goes throughout your colon, and x-rays are taken. The radiologist actually looks for abnormalities, so it's actually looking for the polyps in, in this barium right here. This test is to be done every five years. One of the negative things about the test is that um, you are not able to see very small polyps, and even if you do see them, you still have to go and get a colonoscopy. The good thing is you don't have to take a prep. For a sigmoidoscopy, it's a camera looking at the rectum and the sigmoid section only. So we went over the anatomy earlier, um, and this is the rectum and the sigmoid and then that's it. Um, you do have to take a prep for this test. You do not get any sedation for this test normally, and it's done every five years. Personally, I don't re recommend doing this test for colon cancer screening for any of my patients, because as you can see, it only gets about a third of the colon, and therefore all of the rest of the colon is missed. So we equate it to having a mammogram on only one chi chi. So you don't want to do just one side, you want to do the whole side. CT colonography is another method. So what you're doing is you actually drink the preparation that you would have to drink for a colonos colonoscopy, and you go in and you get a CT scan done. It actually is very cool technology because you can see the polyps here 
the kind that we mentioned earlier that you could see in the colonoscopy. The polyp size, though, matters. So if you have a smaller polyp that's less than five millimeters, so maybe like a quarter of an inch or so, it's not really good at detecting it, basically what this is saying. The sensitivity is how good it is at detecting it. If you have a polyp that's, di uh, that's uh, found on CT colonography that's six to nine millimeters, it's also not very good at detecting it. And the recommendation is to have a repeat CT scan in three years or a colonoscopy referral. If you have a polyp that's greater than a centimeter, it's better at detecting it and a colonoscopy referral is recommended. But if I were you, if I had any polyps in my colon, I would rather have a colonoscopy. So why not just get the colonoscopy is what I say. What the colonoscopy is, it's a camera looking at the rectum and the entire colon. It's done every 10 years if you have zero polyps in your colon. Um, the bad part about it, of course, is the preparation. Um, and most of it is, you know, drinking that gallon of preparation. Patients tell me it tastes like salty seawater um, or salty some other kind of water. Um, but the benefit of doing a colonoscopy is that uh, we can detect the polyps and we can remove the polyps. And this is the only screening test that can actually prevent you from developing a cancer. So I highly recommend that, that test. Go lightly. That's kind of a misnomer, don't you think, for those of you guys who had go lightly? What it is is it's a non-absorbable solution. So basically there's a lot of salt in there, some sugar that doesn't get absorbed in your body. And so it stays in that lumen that we talked about in the colon and it pulls water in so it kind of ha makes that diarrhea effect. The best thing about this solution is one, all the studies shows that this is the best thing to clean out your colon and it's the clean it. Like when we compare all the different solutions, this is the one that's the cleanest. It also minimizes a lot of the electrolyte and fluid shifts. So when you look at sodium and potassium and calcium and all those things in your labs that you get drawn, it actually minimizes those numbers from going up and down and getting all out of whack. And so because it, it, it's, it minimizes that, it's better for patients who have kidney disease. It's better for patients who have heart issues. And it's also better for patients who have liver disease or fluid collections in their body. Good thing is that it also doesn't alter the colon histology or so what you see underneath the microscope. Bad things, of course, it's a large volume. Patients don't like it because it causes abdominal bloating and cramping, some nausea. There's a salt fight taste to go lightly, so hence the sewer salty water. And it is best if you're drinking one cup every 10 minutes. So that's quite a lot of volume that you have to drink in a short period of time. They came out with a new one that has less of the sodium in it, so hopefully this one tastes better. I tried both of them and it, well, it could, it tastes a little bit better because it doesn't have that sulfur smell or taste to that one. But the new Lightly has a little bit more salt and patients say it's a little bit more palatable. But it is very important to get the prep down so we can actually see what's going on in the colon. So as I mentioned earlier, we have polyps that are five less than five millimeters. And if you have an excellent prep, so no stool in the colon, it's very easy to detect those very small polyps and take them out. A good prep, you still have some of this yellow stool down here, but it's liquid, washable. We can suction it out and see it, see behind it. A fair prep, is one that has some stool, some liquid, a little bit of solid, but still can see around it. And we can detect polyps that are bigger than five millimeters. 
And of course, this is a poor prep. I'm sorry for those of you who might have eaten, but you knew you were coming to a colonoscopy talk, so. Um, so uh, this is a poor prep where we see stool in the colon and we're not able to detect polyps that are underneath. So it's very important to chug that gallon down. Just a little polyp humor. I'm a young polyp. I've got my whole neoplastic or cancer transformation ahead of me. Don't take me out. This is how we take out polyps. So smaller polyps, the ones that are less than five millimeters, you see here. So this is the uh, end of the colonoscope. So this is the part that goes inside the rectum. And there is what we call a working channel here. Through the working channel, we can put a variety of tools. And this tool in particular is called a biopsy forcep. So we take that forcep where um, I have a tech that's next to me. I have them open up the forcep and then close the forcep and we're able to uh, take out that polyp. If you have a larger polyp, another tool is sent down that biopsy channel and it's called a snare. A snare is like a lasso and you carefully place it over the polyp. The technician next to you actually closes around that polyp and if the polyp is larger, you see the smoke here, it's actually using cautery and as well as cutting to take off that polyp and that polyp is removed and sent to the lab so they can look at it underneath the microscope. This is um, another photo to show you that the polyps are actually in the mucosal lining. So we went over those lining, the different linings of the colon earlier. So to prevent you from becoming stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four cancer, uh, the polyp, which is in the mucosal layer or the first layer, is removed. If polyps are in deeper layers, that's where they are uh, deemed to be colon cancer. So again, we're, we're in the business of detecting and removing these before it gets there. So you might be asking, how can I reduce my risk for developing colon cancer? So 45% of colorectal cancers are preventable, mostly by those uh, modifiable risk factors or things that you can change in your lifestyle. Here's our five easy steps that I tell patients. One, increase your activity and exercise. Two, stay a healthy weight and watch out for abdominal fat. Uh, eat plenty of fiber, decrease red meat, and moderate alcohol use. So exercise, fit activity into your day as much as possible. So patients say, I don't have time to exercise. Well, you have time to park your car farther away in the parking lot than where you need to go and take the stairs up to the fifth floor um, to your office. Start by finding 10 minutes a day though to try to move. So just by doing that, it can help to decrease your risk of colon cancer. If you can, increase this to 30 minutes per day and five days, five days a week. So not only does this help to prevent or lower your risk for colon cancer, it also helps to prevent and lower your risk for a lot of other things as well. One of them being irritable bowel syndrome, which I also talk to my patients about. Stay a healthy weight. Excess body fat is linked to increased risk of not only colon cancer, but a number of other gastroenterology cancers, stomach cancer, esophageal cancer, pancreatic cancer. Carrying excess belly fat in the midsection, uh, regardless of your weight, um, is a risk factor as well too. So unfortunately, if we look at the shape of people, the apple-shaped people, even if you're a healthy weight, we, we need to try to get that abdominal section a little bit smaller. Some of the recommendations that I make to help patients with this is become portion size savvy. That means we're actually supposed to be eating five to six small meals throughout the day. So the, the type of diet that we've become accustomed to, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and big dinner, is not the best way to eat. Actually, you should be eating every three hours or so and five to six small meals throughout the day and limiting desserts and sweets. Of course, it sounds self-explanatory, but I, as, I, as I know and as you know, it's very hard to do. Eat fiber. Patients always tell me, 
I eat so much fiber. But I actually, in my office, I take a dietary history with my patients, and we calculate it out. And I find that patients are not eating as much fiber as they think they are. So actually, the recommendation is at least 25 grams of fiber per day uh, for a, the average man and woman. If you increase your fiber by 10 grams every day, you can reduce your risk of colorectal cancer by 10%. A good way to try to increase your fiber is to fill your plate two thirds of the way with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, those types of things which are high in fiber. It's very easy to Google and just say high fiber diet. It's very important to look at nutrition facts as well too uh, when you look at the labels and look at the dietary fiber section. Limiting red meat is actually a good way to prevent colon polyps and colon cancer as well too. So not only red meat, but processed foods. Unfortunately, that's all the good stuff, like corned beef and Spam and Portuguese sausage and all the things that we love. <laughs> Hot dogs, bacon, and deli meats as well too. So one of the recommendations is to avoid the processed meats and to limit red meats like hamburger, pork, and lamb to 18 ounces per week. Drinking alcohol in moderation. If you don't drink, don't start drinking because it's not going to help you to prevent colon cancer. For men, no more than two standard drinks per day. And for women, no more than one standard drink per day. And you might think, oh, my big gulp cup is a standard drink size. No, it's not. So <laughs> alcohol in moderation is a 12-ounce regular beer. So that's the can, not the pints not the big ones, okay? Um, six to nine ounces of malt liquor. So this is actually a 12 ounce glass, right? Remember what you usually get in the restaurants are 16 ounce glasses. Five ounces of table wine. So you can't have the glass filled all the way up to here. Usually five ounces is actually a little bit less than this when you look at those larger wine glasses and 1.5 ounces of, of liquor, like vodka, gin. And so that's a very small jigger shot. So know exactly what these uh, things are. So those are just some of the things that I wanted to share with you about colon cancer uh, screening, colon cancer awareness, and how to prevent them. Thank you for coming to my talk. Do you folks have any questions? How is your We'll come down. Hi, you talk about the um, progress of the polyp on these stages and stuff like that. How likely is it for a polyp to develop into those stages, going from a you know polyp and you don't get it, you know taken care of or whatever it is, to becoming cancerous? I mean, what's the likelihood of of that happening? So it depends on what type of polyp it is. So if it is truly an adenomatous polyp or a precancerous polyp, the risk of turning into colon cancer is 0.4% per year. But there are not really a lot of studies that do that because you don't want to see the polyp, leave it in, and then like watch everybody to see if it's going to develop into cancer. So. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lopez, for sharing this a very informative talk. Um, it always, in your lecture inclusive, it says uh, no more than two drinks for, uh, for men, one for women. But no one talks about after that. Sure, three is worse than two, four is worse than three, but is it a, a linear uh, progression or is it uh, go up? How How is that... Uh, is it, is it a curve or is it a line that goes up four, five, six drinks? Which, which way does it go? So um, I'm not sure of the actual progression. If it's linear, if it's like a parabola, like a, what, you know, going up like this, going down like that. Um, but uh, drinking three drinks, four drinks, five drinks, not only, I, I can't really tell you. 
but it also puts you at, and I'm in the field of GI, so it also puts you at risk for liver failure as well too, um, when you drink more than three drinks uh, a day. But I can't tell you what the trajectory is, if it's just a one-to-one -one or, yeah. Go ahead. Yes, um, for diverticulitis, is probi taking probiotics recommended or some colon cleaner? So diverticulitis is an inflammation of diverticula. Diverticula are pockets in the colon. So if you've had your colonoscopy um, and your doctor says you have these pockets or out pouchings, those are called diverticula. If things get stuck inside or for some reason your bowels are not um, moving as well, you may have uh, the risk of developing diverticulitis. So um, the recommendation to be on probiotics uh, is not one that I recommend um, because of the lack of studies that show that probiotics helps in patients with diverticulitis. For diverticulitis, what I do recommend is patients on a high fiber diet. If you are newly diagnosed with diverticulitis, um, you would be put on antibiotics. If you never had a colonoscopy before the diagnosis of diverticulitis, you should get one because what you're looking for is something that's blocking your plumbing, right? So diverticulitis happens usually if you're not having good bowel movements going through and there's like what we call stasis or something just being kind of stuck there. So it is important to get the colonoscopy um, to rule out any polyps or cancers. Um, going further, if you had a partial colectomy, is just dieting, you know, not eating seeds, not, would that be, and eating high fiber, would that, would that be the, the, well, it's just that I have had two episodes uh, in a year for this past three years. And yes, I'm on my second round of antibiotics right now uh -huh. on this last episode. So I wanted to find out how I can avoid it. Yeah, so for diverticulitis, it's um, the studies are inconclusive, meaning that when they say avoid nuts, seeds, and berries, and all those things, there are some studies that say, yes, you should do it, and there's evidence to back that up. And there's some studies that say, oh, it doesn't matter what you eat. Um, I think for you, it is important to discuss this issue with your gastroenterologist and probably a surgeon, um, because there are newer recommendations that have been coming out in terms of how many episodes of diverticulitis you have and what the further treatments are. Yeah, um, what is this thing called a virtual colonoscopy that I read on this one paper? And will they ever get to the point of, well, I've heard of it, swallowing a small camera that will take pictures all the way down? Correct. So <laughs> I, that, uh, we mentioned that, that I do capsule endoscopy. And um, so pill, it's called pill cam. Basically what you do is you um, swallow the pill cam and it goes down and looks and takes a bunch of pictures and it transmits it to a recorder. Um, and then that gets downloaded and I look at all those pictures. Now there is a new thing that's recently come out that is a smart pill for the colon. Um, and that uh, is not prime time yet, but it is something that is coming down the pipeline. Um, and actually, I was supposed to go to a training course in April, but I, I can't. But, but so it is coming down the pipeline. Um, uh, it, virtual colonoscopy is the CT, colono CT colonography that I was talking about earlier. It had the pictures of, the, so the patient goes through the CT scan, and it takes a bunch of pictures, and it puts it together, and it actually, you actually, sorry, you actually look, um, it looks like you're looking through a lumen. So th that is available here in Hawaii. Okay, my question is regarding colon, uh, colon cleansers. Yes. Um, what is your thought on that, and if so, how often should you uh, do the procedure? So I do not personally recommend colon cleansing, and I, 
I don't also recommend colonics. Um, uh, just because uh, in terms of what you're doing for your cleanse, the things that are in the cleanse, uh, it can shift your fluids, it can shift your electrolytes, that, like I had mentioned, and that's why we give that prep in particular because it doesn't do that. Um, and so I, I personally can't recommend that. Doctor, do you recommend the annual stool test in the years we don't take a colonoscopy? I do not. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, why don't you ask about the efficacy of the colonoscopy when you do come across a uh, malignant mass? At what stage is the colonoscopy's biopsy no longer effective? I kind of, I don't really understand. Can yeah. you explain? Oh yes, yes. So if you do have a stage four. Uh, a stage four tumor. Uh -huh. Would the colonoscopy be still be able to biopsy, or, or uh, would there be other protocols taken? So, um, you don't know that you have a stage four cancer before you. Usually, a lot of patients don't know that they have stage four cancer before coming to the colonoscopy. Um, the colonoscopy is at that point. So say you presented to your uh, physician and you had abdominal pain. They did a CT scan and it shows a colon mass. Um, at that point, then, we would go in and do a colonoscopy. It is very important to do that colonoscopy and get biopsies because that's how you make the diagnosis. So it is very important to get that colonoscopy done then. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. I've been diagnosed with uh, proctitis or tentatively IBS. And I take a pre and have gas too. Uh, what would you recommend to, uh, especially uh, with the exception of gas X, what could I use to lessen the gas? To lessen the gas. And uh, just from an aside, what is a fecal transplant? <laughs> so um, for the gas, um, I recommend using Gasex. I also recommend um, actually making sure that you're having good bowel movements. Uh, so I say if you're not having good bowel movements and you're having gas buildup, um, I have my patients use Miralax, one capful um, a day. Um, Miralax is a what we call an osmotic laxative. So it's, it's actually a gentle laxative that pulls water into the colon. It's different from Metamucil, which is the fiber. Um, and, and if it's abdominal bloating and pain, sometimes I recommend my patients going on a specific diet. It's called a low FODMAP diet, and uh, that helps to decrease uh, bloating and gas as well, too. Oh, yeah, sorry. Fecal transplant. Um, so it's most commonly used in um, patients who have the infection C. diff or Clostridium difficile and um, used after they've tried multiple rounds of antibiotics and they're not able to get rid of the bacteria. The reason why a fecal transplant in that case works is because C. diff is a bacteria that takes advantage when other bacteria are not there anymore. So basically, the colon lives in a very nice harmony and symbiosis with billions of bacteria in there. If you take antibiotics, it actually not only kills the bacteria that it's trying to kill, like if you're taking it for a urinary tract infection or pneumonia, it actually kills your good bacteria that's in your colon. So your good bacteria is dead. Your bad bacteria, the C. diff, is running around loose in your colon, causing you to have inflammation and diarrhea. So sometimes the antibiotics don't work in killing that bacteria. So what you do is you actually have a family member willing to donate their stool. You bring it a blender, and you blend up the stool, and you can shower it in your colon with a colonoscopy. Uh, they also have pills of people's stool that you can swallow as well, too. So those are methods of fecal transplant. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, um, I actually have a redundant colon. Yes. And would you recommend 
That it's okay to take magnesium. So for for regularity. For regularity, magnesium does help um, with constipation, and it does have that diarrhea effect. Um, if you're taking magnesium in its pure form, you know, it's probably something that you should talk to your primary doctor about by monitoring um, those levels because I, I really don't know what else medical problems you have. Um, but um, if you're using it as a different, in a different form, so there's magnesium citrate, there's magnesium phosphate, a, a lot of the other components that are added with the magnesium can be a little harmful to the kidneys and things like that. So it's always best to talk to your uh, primary care physician and if not a gastroenterologist about, about taking it. Well, I am <laughs> taking carbonate, I think, but it seems to work very well. Well, and it does work well for some people, yes. Yeah, and it's just that, you know, you have extra long colon. Yeah. So yeah. that's the problem. Right, that's part of the problem, yeah. <laughs> As a non-water drinker, am I at higher risk of getting polyps and colon cancer? As a non-water drinker? I, I'm, I'm not a water drinker. I mean, I don't drink water. Um, I am not sure, but I always recommend that um, you drink 64 ounces of water a day um, with 25 grams of fiber. Because if you don't do that, sometimes you get you know, constipated and things like that. But I don't know of any studies. I haven't looked it up, to be frankly honest, if you don't drink water, if it increases your risk. I'm not sure. If your regular diet is short on fiber, does that fiber powder that you can get at Long's, uh, is that a good substitute? Is it an inadequate substitute, but better than nothing? Or is it all just humbug? Well, I'm going to tell you that personally, I drink 10 grams of fiber in the morning a day right off the bat because I know my diet is not the best and I really, sometimes I don't have time to eat. Um, and so uh, I take Metamucil, which is psyllium fiber, psyllium husk, and then also something like uh, Benafiber, which is, oh, so this one is the soluble fiber. So that gets absorbed into your body. It can also help with cholesterol and heart disease and things like that. The Benafiber is uh, insoluble fiber, so that kind of stays in your colon. So the combination of those two actually help you to bulk up your stools and uh, go and have nice log bowel movements. So I, I recommend it to a lot of my patients. I recommend it to a lot of women who are having problems with constipation, who've had kids, and their uh, pelvic function is not working as well, and they're finding that adding fiber and water to their diet helps tremendously. And, and I can say so too, just by anecdotal for myself. Other questions? Raise your hand. Well, then let's give another round of applause for Dr. Christy Lopez. Wasn't that wonderful? With the question and answers. I could have listened to the answers, the questions and answers going on and on. She had so much wealth of knowledge. I also want to thank uh, Catherine Russ and her team from the Colon Screening Program who is giving out that wonderful information in the lobby. Let's give them a hand. Try to help you, encourage you to get a colon screening. Also want to say mahalo to our Queens volunteers Lon, who's over there, and also James, who had to leave early because his mom came to pick him up. Our next Speaking of Health lecture here at Punchbowl is called, oh, I didn't even write it down. Well, it's about ED emergency care, and we're going to have not one, not two, not three, but four emergency care physicians, and it's like the cream of the crop. We have Dr. Rick Bruno, who is the Queen's Vice President of Patient Care, we have Dr. Howie Klemmer, who is the Queen's Chief of Emergency Medicine. We have Dr. Daniel Cheng, who is the Assistant Chief in Emergency Medicine and the Medical Director of the Emergency Department at Queen's Punchbowl. He is also the Medical Director of the Queen's Care Coalition. We have Dr. Ajit Dubey, who is the Assistant Chief in Emergency Medicine and Medical Director of the Emergency Medicine Department at Queen's West Oahu. They're going to talk about 
the history and future of health care, national health care delivery costs, Hawaii's emergency report card, what you should know before entering a hospital's ED, what determines how quickly a patient is seen in the ED, what you should bring if you're going to the ED, some of the top reasons for an ED visit, and who are what's called the super users and what's being done to help them. That's coming up Wednesday, April 25th, 2018, from 5.30 to 7 p.m., and it's going to be here at the Queen's Conference Center. To register, go to queens.org and click attend a class or call our Queen's referral line at 691-7117. That's going to do it for us this evening. Don't forget to get your tickets validated out with Erin at the front. And thank you for attending Queen's Speaking of Health Lecture. Good night. <laughs>